All right, so just a quick statement. This WebEx call is being recorded and may be posted on DOE's website or used internally. If you do not wish to have your voice recorded, please do not speak during the call or disconnect now. If you do not wish to have your image recorded, please turn off your camera or participate only by phone. If you speak during the call or use a video connection, you are presumed to consent to recording and to the use of your voice or image. So with that, thank you, and I hope you enjoy this presentation. We have a very exciting lineup, and I'll let them take it from here. Thank you. My name is Alan Boyle. I'm a contributing editor to GeekWire. I've written about science and space for more than 20 years, and I'm pleased to be the moderator for this virtual roundtable discussion on the Department of Exploration, otherwise known as the Department of Energy. Uh, we're going to be talking about all the ways that the, the department uh, works uh, with all its partners, as well as its national labs and and uh, and other uh, other officials to uh, facilitate space exploration. We hear a lot about what NASA is doing, not so much about what the Department of Energy is doing, but we're we're going to be changing that today. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dan Bruyat, the Secretary of Energy. He's had three decades of experience in the public as well as in the private sector. Uh, he's had executive roles at Ford and USAA. Uh, he's dealt with energy policy as a congressional staffer and a state regulator. And uh, he uh, served as Assistant Secretary of Energy back from 2001 to 2003. And uh, in 2017, he became Deputy Secretary of Energy and in December, he was confirmed to lead the Department of Energy. And so uh, I'd like uh, Dan to uh, make some remarks to start us off and set the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate that introduction. Very kind. It's a pleasure to be with all of you and join the conversation about uh, what I feel is our department's essential and expanding efforts in space exploration. Uh, and as you pointed out, Alan, and as many of you know, here at the Department of Energy, we refer to it internally as DOE, but we like to fondly call it uh, the Department of Exploration because that's truly what it is. You know, we've powered America's reach into the solar system for decades now. Uh, over the past 50 years, we've enabled space exploration, I think, on nearly 30 missions, including the Perseverance rover that's now headed to Mars. Uh, we've also powered the Galileo mission to Jupiter, the Cassini mission to Saturn, and the Voyager and New Horizon missions to the outer edges of the solar system and even beyond. And that doesn't even include the work that was done on specialized solar cells that were developed by NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory out in Colorado, uh, which powered the first two Mars rovers uh, into a, in addition to a number of different satellites that are still up. Uh, but all of that great work, all of that great work, that was yesterday. Uh, today, we're gonna start doing something new. You know, we rejoined the, the National Space Council this past February uh, in order to take up the challenges of a new era in space development and exploration. And as President Trump said just this past July, the United States will lead the return of humans to the moon, followed by human missions to Mars uh, and perhaps even other destinations. But that new strategy is going to require us to think differently, and it's going to require us to act boldly and to do our part, the DOE, it's gonna take a whole of department approach to this new challenge. Uh, and it's gonna involve programs that one might not think of uh, when we're thinking of space. And to state that very simply, uh, a sustained human presence on the moon, Mars, uh, and even beyond, uh, will need the talents of energy experts from many DOE offices. And you'll hear from a couple of those later today. Uh, but to develop and execute this whole of department approach, what I'm doing here inside of the department is to establish a high-level space coordination group that cross-cuts our entire enterprise and includes my policy team and many of the department, departmental program offices and representatives from our national laboratories. Uh, earlier this year, uh, I charged the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board with developing strategic advice and guidance for our space-related programs. And that's an effort that's being led by a former STRATCOM commander, Admiral Richard Meese, uh, as well as the former CEO of Lockheed Martin, Norm Augenstein. And in order to ensure uh, that our work will have the maximum impact, we're engaging at a strategic level with other departments and agencies. And to give you an example of that, we're offering our expertise to the DOD and the U.S. Space Force 
uh, as this new military service works to defend American interests and equities in the space domain. At the same time, and you know, we've been meeting with uh, colleagues at NASA to better align our department's activities to support their efforts and align us more closely with the president's overall strategy. And together, we're revitalizing a, a NASA DOE memorandum that recently established an executive committee that's co-chaired by the Na NASA Deputy Administrator, Jim Moorhart, and our Deputy Secretary of Energy, Mark Menzies. And that will be supported by senior level working groups to address our highest priority uh, on shared technical challenges. And amongst the foremost challenges is developing a sustained human presence beyond low Earth orbit. orbit. Um, it, 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 the, the challenge here is supplying reliable and resilient power uh, in the harsh environment of space. And this is, I think, where we at DOE truly come to the fore. Uh, as part of a broader strategy to regain American global leadership in nuclear energy, uh, we're leading the effort with the private sector to promote the development and deployment of small modular reactors and micro reactors. And these are technologies that could be modified to provide sustainable power sources for space applications, you know, such as surface power and importantly, nuclear propulsion. Specifically, uh, we're partnering with NASA to demonstrate surf surface fission reactors uh, as well as nuclear propulsion technologies, which will support the power requirements for permanent outposts on the moon and eventually for crewed missions to Mars. Uh, nuclear propulsion could potentially cut the time of space travel to Mars by as much as half, which increases mission flexibility, which can be a true game changer for a Mars mission. As we like to refer to it here inside of DOE, uh, we'd like to get to Mars and back on one tank of gas. That's our goal, and uh, that's what we're working for. But uh, beyond both of these technologies, we could potentially uh, send explorers even further into space, uh, outward into the solar system, opening up new and even more distant frontiers. So, uh, Alan and, and the rest of the, the people on the call, thank you for allowing me to you know, join you and uh, kick off this discussion today. Uh, I'm sure the rest of this event will be inspiring. Uh, we need to dream big here. And we need to reach beyond what we currently think is impossible, is possible, I should say. Uh, the president and the vice president are certainly doing exactly that. And uh, together we can fulfill their vision for America's leadership in the sustained exploration and development of space. Uh, soaring even higher uh, with renewed confidence, uh, enduring determination, and absolutely relentless drive. Uh, thank you, Alan. Thank all of you for the opportunity to be with you. And uh, I hope you have a great conversation today. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. You've already given us a lot of uh, a lot of things to chew over in our discussion that's coming up later. And, and I know some people are already starting to ask questions for that. So I appreciate you being here and uh, and uh, Godspeed, as they say. Godspeed uh, to you. <laughs> I want to introduce uh, the Department of Energy's uh, Undersecretary for Science. Paul DeBar. Uh, Paul has been a nuclear submarine officer in the Navy, an environmental researcher for the Navy, as well as for Johns Hopkins University's Applied Physics Laboratory, and the managing director at uh, J.P. Morgan, specializing in the energy sector. Uh, he uh, came to the Energy Department and was confirmed in uh, 2017 as Undersecretary for Science, and uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, the Department of Energy's uh, space exploration activities. Take it away. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. I like to I like to thank the introduction, Alan, by you and by Secretary Briat, uh, and for everyone who's uh, joining today. Uh, you know, welcome. Uh, we'd like to uh, thank uh, the Secretary for his leadership in this vital area of space exploration that he gave a quick summary of. Um, Alan, thank you for having us here, at, at, you know, thank you for hosting us, uh, whether you're on GeekWire or Cosmic Log or NBC, uh, you know, you're, uh, you're a to-be-read uh, uh, person on, on any of those platforms, uh, anyone who's interested in uh, space science and technology. Um, the Secretary, uh, you know, gave a great overview of our new uh, efforts and developments at NASA. He mentioned about uh, a lot of our history, obviously, of supporting various missions and energy and other areas. And I'd like to widen that lens out just a little bit more of the sort of things that, uh, that, uh, that he introduced. 
um, you know, the vision isn't just about uh, uh, for space. It's not just about uh, uh, getting to where we're going, but it's also what do we want to do when we get there. Um, humanity's footprint for uh, throughout the solar system will be uh, presenting us with new opportunities and leverage our expertise and capabilities for scientific discovery and technology. And we want to make certain that we can not only get there, but also thrive and accomplish uh, the various different uh, missions for humanity, including science. Um, we've uh, been very supportive of uh, NASA and the overall space effort, uh, whether in low Earth orbit at uh, ISS and various uh, um, telescopes that are deployed uh, in low Earth orbit, uh, or to the moon, or Mars, or beyond, uh, which I'll certainly uh, touch about uh, uh, touch about all that here today. Um, uh, there's a number of things that we've been uh, over the course of history that we've uh, in the near history that we've been partnering with NASA on. Uh, it includes the, Fermi, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. Uh, the Planck Cosmic Microwave Background uh, uh, Mission, which is you know my particular uh, uh, one that I, I I like to focus on, because we have also have a similar telescope that we work with NASA on at South Pole Station. I've been uh, South Pole as well as North Pole, uh, and I went to South Pole a little bit less than a year ago, where we have uh, an additional uh, Cosmic Microwave Background. Uh, telescope uh, that we uh, map uh, the first years uh, right after the Big Bang, uh, which is really inspirational, whether you think of the Planck telescope that we worked on or the CMB telescope at South Pole Station, uh, understanding how the galaxies were formed in their first uh, 370 so uh, years, a uh, thousand years uh, right after the Big Bang is, is, uh, is part of our contribution that we, that we do along with NASA and the rest of the space uh, 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 related agencies, uh, and, and also, as I mentioned, uh, International Space Station, the Alpha Magnetic uh, Spectrometer, uh, which we just did some maintenance on uh, up at ISS uh, just a few months back, uh, which helps us uh, understand, uh, uh, you know, the, the nature of the universe and also understand, uh, hopefully, as we continue to push on uh, potential knowledge for dark, uh, dark energy and dark matter. Uh, more recently, uh, the Dark Energy Survey, an international collaboration hosted by Fermilab, uh, finished a six-year effort to provide more insights into the nature of dark energy. Um, along the way, it and its uh, dark energy camera made a number of other uh, unexpected discoveries, which uh, always seems to happen in space and science in general. We discovered 12 new moons uh, going around uh, Jupiter, and we discovered several uh, dwarf satellite galaxies to our Milky Way that we had not uh, discovered uh, previously. So that's a great example of, uh, of us uh, developing uh, user facilities, science tools, in this case telescopes and detectors, and us finding things that we didn't even intend to uh, originally focus on when we built the, the various facilities. Uh, we just had an upgrade to the Dark Energy uh, spectr uh, Spectrometer Instrument, uh, DESI, um, that's uh, posed to pick up uh, work on, on that particular area uh, and uh, peer uh, into the night sky. Uh, and uh, the camera, the dark energy uh, camera, was one of the um, telescopes that was used uh, as the uh, Earth-wide interferometer that took the first picture of the black hole that NSF led up. And, and we, we participated in that, and obviously, um, you know, the picture of, of the, first, uh, the first black hole uh, was, I think, very inspiring to many people around the world as it was uh, certainly picked up by a lot of uh, mass media for a few days when that, when that took place. Um, uh, you know, in, in addition to that, uh, we're, as we think about things going forward, um, you know, whether we're trying to support a Europa mission on energy uh, or one that we're uh, currently talking about with, uh, with NASA, where we're looking at possibly sending out uh, an RFI uh, to look at uh, whether we might be interested in, in putting uh, a science detector, a telescope, or some other sort of detector at the Artemis moon base. And, uh, and if you stop and think about you know, what's going to be accomplished uh, in the moon to Mars mission, uh, and as people talk about the potential science as well as uh, getting data for, uh, for human habitability that would be applicable to Mars, um, uh, that the science mission, we very much are, are interested in trying to uh, have further conversation with the community if there are other devices that we should be thinking about 
us uh, helping uh, organize and fund and, uh, and, and with the uh, help of NASA deploy to the Artemis moon base. Uh, after uh, after it starts operation in 2024, um, we've been trying to reach out to the commercial community uh, to, under to to let everyone understand that the sort of capabilities we have at the national labs are available. Obviously, the commercial uh, space sector has been incredibly dynamic and uh, accelerating, to use a, um, a space term for uh, the, the that space space uh, the 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 space is uh, is accelerating in terms of its. Uh, uh, of, of how it fills out the universe, uh, and that's a dark energy topic. And uh, we think the commercial sector is doing the same. Uh, and so we've created in the lab partnering service, which is an online portal to connect commercial sector to various research that's happening at the national labs that a commercial entity might want to talk with a PI to figure out if that's a technology that they might want to try to license or pick up and run with. Um, so, the LARP, uh, so everyone should take a look if you're interested in the, the lab partnering service online. And there's a special space portal that we created solely as a subsector of, uh, of the lab partnering service website so that people can find that and try to see what specific space innovations we're working on. And once again, hopefully uh, someone, someone watching this uh, might find something interesting that you can start a conversation with. Um, so uh, thank you for having us. Obviously, there's been a very long history, whether it's Enrico Fermi or Leo Zillard or Oppenheimer or Lawrence at the National Lab Complex, um, who've uh, achieved a lot by both thinking and doing, um, and in the area of space uh, and the potential for Moon to Mars and other missions. Uh, we very much look forward to participating. And once again, our, our goal at, uh, at, at DOE is uh, for, for people to recognize that it's uh, not just about our energy mission, which is, uh, which is also uh, a very key, but that we're also, uh, DOE also stands for the Department of Exploration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Thanks for your kind words about uh, what I've been doing and, and uh, also uh, especially for your words about what the department has been doing. Uh, I uh, had an occasion to look through uh, everything that, uh, that the national labs have been doing on the space front, and it's an amazing spectrum of, of things. You've touched on a lot of them. Uh, at Sandia, there's a robo hopper that they're working on that would go to Mars, and, and also uh, Los Alamos has been working on the SuperCam uh, for the uh, Mars rover Perseverance, as well as the microphone, uh, just uh, all sorts of um, amazing stuff. So it, it's a real eye opener to to see what everyone is doing, and, and yeah, I, yeah. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, I mean the one the, the one interesting thing which hasn't hit a lot of press is that, as we all know, Perseverance is going to be taking some rock samples and packaging them for the uh, the Mars return. And one of the things that we're talking about is obviously those samples need to go someplace and to be imaged. They need to be characterized. And uh, several of our national labs, including Brookhaven National Lab, I got a Brookhaven yeah, pullover on today. Uh, that was coincidental, by the way. The, uh, um, to use a light source at Brookhaven to actually be the, the location where those samples are taken to to do the imaging. So that's another, another thing which is uh, uh, just starting, and hopefully it's another exciting uh, contribution we might be able to make. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Now I want to turn to our panelists. We've got an amazing uh, set of panelists to uh, go into more depth and, and eventually take your questions as well. Uh, and if I were to talk about all the qualifications uh, of, of the group, uh, we'd be here for the rest of the hour. So I'm just going to mention who we've got and then turn it over to, to them to, to talk about their perspectives. So we have uh, Dr. Ben Reinke, who is Executive Director of the Department of Energy's Office of Strategic Planning and Programs, uh, Dr. Kevin Greenaw, Assistant Deputy Administrator for Strategic Partnership Programs at the National Nuclear Security Administration, uh, Eric Stalmer, who is the President of the Commercial Space Flight Federation, uh, Tracy Bishop, uh, Deputy Ass Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Infrastructure Programs at the Department of Energy's Nuclear Energy Office, uh, Dr. Ralph McNutt, uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, and former Congressman Bob Walker, founder and chief executive officer of Moonwalker Associates. Uh, fantastic group. I, I think I'll start with, start with Dr. Reinke, 
just to kind of uh, continue the discussion about the overview of what, what uh, the department is doing, uh, whether it's for Artemis or for other space programs and, and uh, how you see things uh, developing uh, in light of the initiatives that have been started in the past few years. Thanks so much, Alan. Can you hear me? You bet. Great. Um, so, uh, you know, there's been a lot already said about individual programs where we've made uh, significant progress in the past, uh, for both from the Secretary and, and Undersecretary DeBar. Um, I'd like to focus a little bit uh, to, to, to engage on your question on the vision that has been laid out uh, by the administration. So, you know, really this is uh, the, the vision of the president. It's the, the vision of the vice president in terms of getting back to, to the moon, having a sustainable presence there, and then getting uh, to Mars successfully uh, on an accelerated time schedule. Um, it, it's, a, it, it's a big ask, and I think uh, the whole of government approach that, that this administration is taking will be required to meet those, those challenges. In doing so, um, you know, the reinvigoration of the National Space Council was a, uh, an opportunity for the interagency to get together and kind of create the, the, the overarching vision for, uh, and plan for how we'll, we'll get back to uh, space to, to meet each of these big goals. And DOE really wanted to engage um, in this process and to support other agencies that have, or departments that have space as part of their core mission. So while we recognize that the Department of Energy has a, a very large uh, and wide-ranging mission to begin with. We do have a lot of technology development that uh, has occurred in the past that's directly relevant to, to space. And so we believe that DOE can be an important enabler for uh, both NASA and uh, the Department of Defense in meeting their goals. So with that, we've taken a, a sort of different approach than we have in the past. We have uh, brought the team together inside of the department and uh, we have many offices represented. Today, you'll hear from two of our experts, uh, leaders that are part of this uh, intra-DOE uh, collaboration. And that team has been building uh, sort of the, the base knowledge within the department of all of the capabilities we have that could be brought to bear and thinking about how we're going to connect to the, the mission space of these other agencies and departments. In particular, uh, I think one noteworthy success that the secretary hit on earlier is the collaboration with NASA. Uh, historically, DOE has had many successful projects with NASA. And we typically think of those as being, you know, tailored to a specific project and within a line of effort of the department. Sometimes a laboratory builds something, like you mentioned earlier, uh, building the, the sort of the head robot of the, the Perseverance uh, uh, rover that will be hitting Mars soon. Um, that's a huge win. But we haven't necessarily taken a, a whole of department look at what we could bring to bear on these challenges. So that's what we're doing now. In, in particular with NASA, we are uh, aligning from the top of the organizations on down uh, around the big goals, the big challenges that we face. And I think you'll hear a lot about that today, but we're looking at how do you really power sustainably a human presence on, on the moon in a reliable and resilient way? How can we bring the different technologies that are under development right now together into you know, a microgrid on the moon? How can we build a, a, a mission that gets to Mars and back safely? Um, so we hope that the department's technologies will be the, the key enablers that we'll be able to uh, bring to uh, pair with, with NASA's mission needs and ultimately get to uh, meet the, the requirements set forth by the president and the vice president. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, um, we're going to get into this and drill down a little further, but uh, we've been kind of talking around the history of uh, the Department of Energy's involvement in space exploration, and, and I thought it would be great to step back and talk about what's been done in the past, and, and uh, Dr. Ralph McNutt would be a great person to do that. He's been involved with these programs for, for so many years. Uh, uh, and so uh, I'd love to hear your perspective on, on the, the history for the DOE's involvement in space exploration. Well, thank you, Alan. Yes, um, I think people don't realize how enabling the DOE and its predecessor agencies have been uh, in space exploration. Right now, there are only five spacecraft that are leaving the gravitational field of the sun. Uh, Pioneer 10 and 11, uh, New Horizons, and Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, and all of these are powered by radioisotope power supplies that were supplied by uh, by the DOE, 
and its predecessor agencies. And again, uh, they're enabling it. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do this. Um, I'm actually uh, a member of the science team on New Horizons and was there for our Pluto flyby. I was also there when the, the mission was conceived. And as a graduate student, I watched Voyager 1 and 2 launch, and I'm still on those science teams. And yes, we still get data back from the Voyagers. We're almost one light day out. We get data back uh, every week at about 160 bits a second when we're back to the spacecraft. And it's absolutely clear that uh, none of these things would exist, and the human race would not have been able to scientifically reach beyond the asteroid belt if it had not been for uh, the Department of Energy and for the technologies that have been developed and are maintained now uh, with NASA in that partnership. And if we're going to do, if we're going to go farther and do more, uh, again, uh, it's a question of these things being enabling. There just simply is no other way of doing it. Uh, we've had uh, similar experiences back to uh, with the Atomic Energy Commission, going back to the Atomic Energy Commission. Looking back at the old NERVA program, when we were actually developing uh, nuclear thermal rocket engines, and uh, we got a good start on that when the, the when the, the program was shut down. But again, we did enough to understand what it was going to take, what the technical challenges are, and the fact that uh, these really are enabling for doing things uh, such as uh, certainly sending crews to Mars. So. Uh, I'm very heartened to hear the, the uh, remarks earlier by the secretary and uh, look forward to a very bright future uh, for space exploration. And again, uh, DOE's got to be there or it's not going to happen. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ralph. Uh, I wanted to turn to Tracy Bishop, uh, the De Deputy Assistant Secretary, uh, maybe to, to fill us in a little bit about uh, the uh, role that nuclear plays. We've talked a lot about uh, the nuclear power in space, uh, and, and uh, maybe you can expand upon that and, and uh, fill out the picture that we've got. Yes, yes, thank you, and good morning. Um, it's been quite an adventure uh, working with the DOE and the space community over the last four years. And as you've heard, you know, um, nuclear power has really played a key role over the last 50 years. Um, going forward, though, we're, we're not taking any of that for granted, and we are moving forward in a direction to really look at how we conduct our nuclear activities, how we conduct nuclear business, and how we can align and transform um, this uh, whole platform to move forward with NASA, the Department of Defense, and, and the commercial industry to really uh, engage in um, supplying nuclear power for a much broader community. Um, things that we've really been focusing on are transforming our, our regulatory framework, um, looking at how we can in, improve our mission um, repetitions, shortening, shortening the cycle time. Um, historically, we've had seven to 10 years between nuclear missions. We're looking at now supporting missions that are on a three to five year basis. So that really requires us to think through our whole supply chain. Um, when we look forward to incorporating fission power systems, um, we are looking at a whole department approach, including bringing laboratory teams together to work in partnership with NASA and our commercial industries, bringing some of the synergy that is already there from the small modular reactor and micro reactor programs, looking at how we can apply that technology going forward to support the sustainable habitats for the moon and eventually Mars. Great. Uh, and, and I know Dr. Greenaw at the National Nuclear Security Administration uh, you play a pretty key role in uh, providing that power. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what the NNSA uh, does and, and uh, how you see things moving forward from your perspective. Yes, uh, within the National Nuclear Security Administration, we have three primary missions, and that is nuclear deterrence as well as nonproliferation and counterterrorism. But within that mission, we develop tools and capabilities that can be uh, and are applicable to the space challenges. And so, as you stated, one of those is power sources. And so at our Los Alamos National Laboratory, 
we process the plutonium-238, we encapsulate it, and then we send it to Idaho National Laboratory. We also contribute to the transportation of the power sources to the launch site. And so we do a number of things in that area. In the fundamental science area, we have capabilities that are looking at the plasma physics and things of that nature, discovery science associated with space. Uh, when you look at defense, we are doing a number of things supporting space protection as well as planetary defense and, and things like that. And then also we're in innovation uh, and technologies, we are developing new technologies that, again, are applicable to the space application. Fantastic. We're, we're going to broaden this discussion out a little bit and, and uh, talk about uh, kind of the uh, uh, commercial aspect of all this. Uh, actually, I wanted to start with uh, Congressman Walker because uh, you've been involved on both sides of the table. You, uh, you've been involved in policymaking and, and uh, you're also involved in trying to figure out how this uh, new environment for space policy is going to affect commercial operations. And so I'd love to have you draw upon your history and uh, your perspective on this. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, the um, uh, exciting thing about this is to hear about all the collaboration that's going on, because it is a collaboration among government agencies, as well as with the commercial sector. Uh, and uh, what we're seeing uh, is the development that came in large part from the, uh, the, having the National Space Council put together. Uh, back some years ago, four years ago, in fact, uh, a handful of us were writing a space policy for the Trump campaign. And one of the things we emphasized was the uh, reinstitution of the National Space Council. And inside the Space Council now, they're pulling together uh, the various agencies uh, that have uh, some history and some responsibility. Uh, it took a long time to get here. Um, uh, I worked on this for 20 years uh, when I was in the Congress. I worked on it uh, for another 20 years since I've been out of Congress. Uh, and um, uh, we're now seeing uh, the culmination of a lot of technologies uh, and um, particularly a lot of enthusiasm about what we can do in space. And the energy piece of this is really important uh, because uh, as we look at uh, going beyond the moon into the solar system, uh, you really do have to have the kind of propulsion that allows you to do it in um, a time frame uh, that's manageable for humans. Uh, you really do need to have sustainable power on the surface of uh, the moon and, uh, and planets that we might uh, visit. Uh, and all of that really does involve uh, things that have been done in previously at the Department of Energy but uh, some of the new developments as well that are taking place in the commercial sector. The uh, development of advanced modular nuclear reactors now uh, that use uh, triso fuel is something that the DOD is working on. It's something that, um, uh, that energy is working on, that NASA is working on, and it offers exciting potentials uh, for us in, in, in the future to be able to do on a scale that works for space, uh, nuclear power, um, and uh, have uh, the propulsion and the surface power that uh, will be needed. Fantastic. Uh, actually, um, when you talk about uh, modular nuclear power and, and next generation nuclear power, uh, I'm coming to you from the Seattle area where TerraPower is, uh, is working on that sort of technology for terrestrial reactors with support uh, hopefully from the Department of Energy, and so that that's going to be a big deal. Uh, well, I'm actually a consul oh, I'm actually a consultant with X Energy that's doing the same kind of uh, of work, um, uh, and uh, Terra Power and X Energy uh, have some projects uh, where uh, they're uh, looking at uh, some of the same applications. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that's adapted for space applications. And I think Eric Stalmer, coming from the Commercial and Space Flight Federation, have some thoughts on that. So uh, I'd like to weigh in on all that. Okay. Uh, Eric, you're muted. I really thank you for, for hosting this and moderating this today because uh, I think you were one of the first reporters that I I got talking to when I when I joined this organization about a little over six years ago. So you've been a, a staunch um, advocate and you know a, a reporter with kind of the highest integrity of really getting out the stories and the good news stories that that exist.
exists today. Um, as I was, you know, kind of reflecting on, on talking with the Department of Energy today, I realized uh, a couple things. You know, when our organization, CSF, uh, came about, you know, it was about for some young entrepreneurs that wanted to put a vehicle into space. And they were engineers and, and uh, some of them entrepreneurs, you know, um, wealthy uh, it, from making their, their money in other areas. And I don't think they realize the complexity of government in, in the sense that, you know, yes, you can build a rocket, but what are all the pieces that go into that? And, you know, so you start and you first think NASA, because NASA does space. And, and then we're like, well, you need licensing, so we have to go to the Department of Transportation, actually the FAA and their Office of Commercial Space Transportation. And now we have another branch with Commerce and, you know, the Commerce's Office um, of Space Commerce and what they're, what they're doing. And so in this whole government, you know, and, and certainly DOD plays a major role, and now it's come full circle with energy um, or exploration, as I, as I really uh, appreciate the, the Secretary saying, on how they're getting involved and what a crucial role uh, the Department of Energy um, is playing and will play as we go further out in the, into the solar system. So some of the things I wanted to, to focus on today, though, you know, is it's kind of one of the right here, right now issues that we have, um, you know, as we talk about the Artemis program uh, and the nuclear service, you know, power systems that, that uh, is going to be required for Artemis. You know, as a lot of people know about the Artemis program, we're, we're going to return back to the moon. And, and it's, it's been made very clear that as we go back to the moon, it's not just going to be flags and footprints. We, we've done that before. We did that 50 years ago with Apollo. Um, what we need is really a much more sustained uh, presence on the moon in the form of, of a moon base. And, uh, and government has proven that we can do this, but they have to also be a part of this as well. And especially as we're, we're looking at uh, competition, international competition, competition around the world, especially from places like China. So the only way the government um, in the United States is going to achieve this goal is through public-private partnerships uh, with commercial industry. Uh, where, where companies are really, they have a stake in the game. They're investing billions of dollars of private capital to develop capabilities to support the United States. Um, for example, we, you know, we have many CSF members like SpaceX and Blue Origin, Sierra Nevada, um, Max, our Moon Express, Mass and Explore, Helicity, so many that are, that are and, and many others that are developing landers and platforms and in space propulsion that can deliver everything a moon base would require. Uh, the, the various platforms uh, from scouting uh, locations on the moon to actually landing, uh, you know, people um, and, and, you know, having that human presence. And then the power systems that will, um, that will sustain the permanent presence there. Um, so I think what is necessary, though, and it's important for projects like this, um, that, that the space-based nuclear power to proceed off the drawing board and actually having working efforts on the moon and Mars. And the United States, we've long talked about these ambitious programs and projects uh, like super surface nuclear power. Um, but now the question is, how do we start this and, and where will the support come? So I'm really looking forward to having that discussion. And again, looking forward to the role that uh, energy will, will provide uh, in, in going further and faster. Thanks so much, Eric. Uh, I remember uh, writing back in 1997 about the Cassini mission and, and what a controversy that was uh, putting uh, uh, just a, a plutonium powered uh, a generator on, on that probe that went to Saturn. Uh, and, and now we're talking about a project like Kilopower, which aims to put a nuclear power, power source on, on the moon. And so I did want to throw that question out to uh, people from the Department of Energy uh, on this panel. I, I'm, I don't know who wants to jump in on this, but, but uh, what are the hurdles that have been uh, posed in the past to, to having nuclear power, and, and how are we getting over those hurdles? Anyone feel free to weigh in? Hi, this is Tracy. I can uh, go ahead and start that. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, we really are trying to focus on identifying what those barriers are and working with uh, the interagency and also the commercial sector to identify that. One of the 
uh, areas that was identified previously was the regulatory process, the process for approval of nuclear-enabled launches. Uh, recently, uh, last year, um, the administration updated that process to provide clear and defined safety guidelines for approval for launches. They also put in a tiered approach. Previously, all nuclear launches required presidential approval. Now it's a risk-based process such that um, there are tiers and mission agencies who are launching have a lot more authority. Also having those clear guidelines is tied to the current nuclear industry um, regarding risk thresholds and how we account for and measure um, potential risk. So there's a lot more transparency in the process, which really is taking a lot of risk off of missions. The process previously was a seven-year process to go through all the safety reviews um, and analysis. We're seeing benefits of um, being able to leverage existing analyses and leveraging existing uh, thresholds and processes to really take, um, still have the same level of risk-informed, same level of safety and review, but being able to drive that um, earlier in the process to help um, decision makers and communicate and balance um, all of the challenges. And so we're already seeing a lot of benefits from that trans transition, even though it's only been a year. Um, we've been able to start streamlining and looking at developing safety analyses that can be applied for multiple missions um, and be able to uh, look at environmental consequences as well. Great. Anyone else want to weigh in on, on that issue? Uh, I don't know, uh, Dr. Greenaw, whether whether you want to say anything about what NNSA is doing in terms of uh, uh, trying to stretch the envelope uh, on nuclear power in space. I, I suppose that's something that NNSA would have to kind of have a pretty significant role in. Uh, yes, uh, but let me just say something uh, regarding what Tracy just stated. Uh, we work very closely with Tracy and DOE and E in helping to develop the safety analyses that are very important for the launch safety. And so we have a long history at the NNSA laboratories in doing safety analyses of this nature. And then along with INL, who has experience also. And so again, we, we use the talents from throughout DOE to be able to enable the, those safety analyses to actually occur. Uh, I'm really curious uh, if uh, anyone wants to weigh in on uh, what uh, what uh, these future settlements will look like, uh, how uh, a nuclear uh, energy facility would work with, say, a settlement on the moon and Mars. Uh, at one point, we were uh, planning to have a person from SpaceX on. Uh, as it turns out, uh, they're pretty busy with all the business that they've got going on, and so uh, this person wasn't able to attend just because uh, there was other crushing business that they had to deal with. And I, I suppose that's the way it always is, is that that uh, the commercial space sector is just moving so fast nowadays. But that's the end point, I think, uh, is to start uh, developing settlements in space and, and probably powered by uh, nuclear, solar, and whatever else people can manage. So I'd love to hear your ideas on what that future vision is going to look like. Alan, if, if if I could, as Bob Walker, um, uh, one of the one of the advantages of the advanced reactors that we talked about is the fact that the fuel that's being used in them, uh, the, the the pebble-based fuel, the triso fuel, uh, is in, in an inherently safe process. So it means that the regulatory hurdles uh, and uh, a lot of the things that we faced in the past with regard to the danger of the uh, of the launches and so on. Uh, is is mitigated by the type of reactor that we're now talking about, and those reactors uh, can in fact be used in a community type of situation on the moon and elsewhere, uh, producing uh, uh, relatively small amounts of power, like 10 kilowatts uh, in in initial phases. Uh, but uh, because they can be combined into larger frameworks, as the community on on the moon, for instance, expands you can, in fact, expand the amount of power that's able to be generated by putting more of the modules in place. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd like to jump in on that too. Um, there, there are a couple of points I think uh, that sort of weave the last two questions together. Um, as former Cong Congressman Walker just described, uh, the advanced reactors that are under development right now are, are fundamentally very different than what we have deployed in the United States to date. Um, that said, we have a long history of, of nuclear fission research and development associated with space in the country. And um, one thing that's important to, to recognize is that over the last 30 years, uh, there's been a rapid evolving of, evolving of, of the technologies that underpin the uh, overarching uh, sort of look of a reactor. What I mean by that is the fuels have been developed uh, over the last 20 years to support the TRISO fuel that Congressman Walker was just talking about. Uh, that's decades of research through the Department of Energy with industry to be able to develop fuel and test that fuel. Um, in addition to that, materials have evolved quite a bit in that time frame. So uh, we have different materials, we have different fuels, and we have uh, potentially better modeling and, uh, and, and computer simulation for how the reactor would operate changing the margins and the safety uh, as we understand it for the operations of a reactor. If you combine all those things, that's a, a huge leap, even though the technology uh, conceptually is similar to what might have been envisioned in the 60s or 70s. And, and in fact, in many cases, tested. <laughs> um, if, you, if you then take that and you extrapolate it to the, the broader question that you just asked about, uh, what we would do to have a sustainable uh, base on the, on the moon, um, or on Mars, what you're really talking about is, is a very small microgrid uh, that has the same types of challenges that we have here on Earth. Um, you need some amount of power that would be base load power that could provide a sustainable uh, power to the systems that are most critical for life support. And then on top of that, you would have probably some types of, of variable power uh, and storage and distribution system that works for the, the proper size of that base. So in this case, what the department's interested in doing is, is trying to figure out how we could build that type of reliable and resilient system, probably underpinned by a fission reactor system. And uh, we need to uh, work closely with NASA to understand what their requirements will be, uh, how much uh, power will be required, uh, what, what exactly the scope of the work will be um, on the moon base. And then we need to think about things in terms of not just electricity, but a total power system. So thermal power, what that's used for, uh, for providing, you know, thermal support, um, mitigating uh, excess heat in different places, uh, and then dr basically driving the, the production of electric power and distribution of that power. So we're going to be bringing to, to bear question, or technologies like uh, the next generation of energy storage that we're, we're developing at the department, uh, potentially lightweight uh, solar that is under development now, like perovskite solar panels, um, and, and, and any other technologies we can uh, determine would be useful in this, this uh, type of environment and then try to meet the, the mission need as defined by NASA uh, and, and ultimately get there in partnership. That's interesting. So it sounds as if, uh, if when we do have settlements, uh, it'll be a mix of lightweight solar power and, and nuclear. Uh, that, that's uh, kind of a diversified uh, power uh, power portfolio. I, I don't know, Eric, whether you wanted to come in from the commercial side on that. Yeah, I, I just want to echo a little bit what Benjamin was saying. Um, when it comes to these different types of technologies, we certainly have to think differently. You know, we have to think outside the box. And I think that's where you're seeing the success that commercial industry has had. Because they have been thinking differently. They have been uh, testing out new, new uh, areas and, and new um, innovations that have helped propel us. And, you know, one of those areas is fusion. Fusion is a, a really a key technology that needs to be developed, and it, and it takes time. It's not something you can develop, you know, in the near term. This is going to take about a decade. And and I think from everything that we've seen, you know, in the past, you know, and, and not to criticize, but from NASA, DOD, and DOE in the past, that mindset remains that fusion is too far away. But it's only too far away because we keep pushing it, pushing it back. I mean, that's we really have to focus. And also, I think with, with, we're thinking of what powers things on Earth and Earth power. And we have to think differently. Space has its own requirements, but it's, it also has immediate opportunities, especially in the area of propulsion and, and the needs that, you know, uh, to be seen as key areas of immediate focus, you know, to do these things, the, the next generation faster, more powerful, um, further and cleaner. You know, I, 
our, our mutual friend, uh, Alan Stern, who ran the New Horizon mission, you know, what he wouldn't have given, you know, to have a, uh, you know, a little more of this advancement, you know, on the 10 year mission to, to Pluto to advance that and what he's thinking for the next step. So, um, I, again, I think we need to look, um, look and think differently. And I think that's, you know, the advantage that the commercial sector will add. And a lot of these, these companies that are working on uh, areas like in space propulsion and, and propul uh, nuclear power systems. Well, Carl, I love the shout out to Pluto since I wrote a book called The Case for Pluto. So, uh, and speaking of that, uh, APL was, <laughs> APL was a big uh, player in the Pluto mission and uh, Ralph uh, uh, knows the terrain when it comes to uh, propulsion and, and what it's, what's going to be required. And I was hoping you'd be able to touch upon nuclear thermal propulsion and, and what uh, the prospects are for that and, and maybe give a little overview of, of how, how you see things uh, playing into uh, deep space exploration. Well, I could, cer I could certainly talk about that, Alan. Thank you. And uh, I've actually got an instrument that's on board New Horizons. Uh, so I, I keep up with New Horizons every day. Uh, even still, we're getting the, the data back. So. You know, one of the things I've been listening to this, and, and, and one of the things that's been the challenge, and it was it was a challenge with nuclear thermal propulsion when we first uh, started that, and it's been it's been the challenge. I think as we're going forward with space fission, is that we there's a tendency to try to, to kind of get ahead of ourselves, and I think one of the one of the important things is that we basically need to get the first unit up in space. I mean. Uh, the, with, uh, within DOE, of course, DOE, as was remarked upon earlier, has been heavily involved with a lot of the satellite detector programs looking at dark energy. And uh, it's always hard to do things in space. And when, you, when you're going back and trying to do something that you either, either haven't done before or you haven't done for a very long time, you forget how hard that it can be to try to get that first item up there. And so I think one of the one of the real issues is, is actually managing expectations on all of this. Uh, we've been talking now about um, various forms of nuclear thermal propulsion again ever since the NERVA program was shut down in 1973. And the issue has always been that we need to. It's it has been taken longer to get the technology in place than the mission has lasted. And when the mission falls apart, uh, then the money stops. And then the technology goes and gets put on the shelf. And so, you know, one of the things that's been talked about, of course, is telepower uh, as being a way of having a small fission reactor and perhaps in place in the near term. A lot of the a lot of the work on the on the small uh, modular reactors that's going on, the DOE is supporting, and that is coming from the commercial side of the house, also has got a lot of promises. And really, the I think that the real linchpin in all of this is figuring out how we get the first unit into space. We haven't had a, the United States hasn't had a fission reactor in space since SNAP-10A in 1965. Uh, that's very old technology. We, we, again, as people have been remarking, we know things, we know how to do things much, much better these days, much more safely. Um, what we need to do is to just go ahead and do it. And uh, that, that's really, they, you know, it, it's making that first step is always, always really the hard one. With respect to, to nuclear thermal propulsion, because the specific impulse is, is inherently so much higher on that than on any kind of a chemical rocket engine. And we know that because we test fired engines in Nevada that actually demonstrated those numbers in the 1960s. Um, Phoebus 2A ran for 12 and a half minutes had the same power output as an F1 engine on a Saturn V. And it's the sort of engine that you could use uh, as a prototype of things that you could build to indeed enable getting human crews to Mars. But one of the things that we've really got to concentrate on, I think, is getting that first nuclear uh, fission power supply up to the moon. And we could do that robotically and check it out. We're going to learn things in trying to do that. And then the other thing is going to be to, to really start start looking at, at ramping up the hardware again and doing the kind of testing that we're going to need to do uh, to make a successful program while also being safe and secure, which is the, the other two sides of all of this. That's my two cents for 
Well, uh, that begs the question uh, about timelines. Uh, does anyone want to hazard a guess when we'll take that first step, when we'll uh, put a nuclear reactor on the moon? I, I think that uh, kilopower uh, seems to be the, the best prospect for doing that. And then also when we'll have the first uh, nuclear powered rocket. Hi, hi, Alan, it's Tracy. I can take that one. Um, this summer, the department, along with NASA, has uh, initiated um, an activity to look at doing a demonstration for a fission surface power system on the moon in the 2027-2028 timeframe. We had a very uh, engaging industry day back uh, last month where we had a number of commercial partners not only from the uh, nuclear side, which is a lot of the small modular reactor companies, micro reactor companies, but we also had great attendance from the uh, commercial aerospace companies. Um, bringing those two teams together, I think is just gonna be very critical to drive innovation um, in looking at new ways uh, to, to go and move forward to doing a demonstration. Um, Idaho National Lab is, is a key sponsor of, of this uh, activity. And one of the things that you know uh, we're looking to is really trying to leverage the government resources to the extent we can to support demonstration, testing, verification, um, to um, use all the efficiencies um, and synergies that we've gained from um, the commercial industry and bring those forward to be able to apply them for space. So we're looking forward to issuing uh, requests for proposals from industry sometime this fall uh, and moving forward with looking at some concepts that we can use to um, eventually get to a demonstration uh, before the end of this decade. Alan, I also, I also just wanted to, to weigh in here for a minute. Um, the, um, the fact is that um, uh, some of these things uh, also involve some integration uh, possibilities. Uh, for example, the use of the advanced reactors on the moon uh, it does give you the uh, advantage of having uh, heat as a byproduct, uh, which allows you to make hydrogen. Uh, the transportation people are looking at fuel cells uh, to be able to move the rovers around the moon uh, so that um, you can have uh, so integration there. And the other thing that uh, needs to be thought about is the fact that while we focused on nuclear thermal propulsion, there's also the potential for nuclear electric propulsion. Uh, and uh, that would use essentially the same technologies uh, that the advanced uh, reactors that we hope to use for the surface um, uh, in uh, the propulsion uh, sector. So uh, there are some opportunities here for integration as we uh, move these programs forward. Right. And I'd like to say that we've been working with uh, DARPA relative to nuclear thermal propulsion. And so what DARPA is trying to do is they're trying to have a demonstrator that will fly in the 2025 timeframe. And so they've been working with us and DOE and E and trying to do a number of things. First, get the material understand the safety associated with it, understand the test and evaluation that's required, and then being able to participate with the source selection where they're going to industry to say, help us in designing that. And so that is, again, a demonstrator, and that can maybe give you a timeline of where we're thinking DOD is going relative to computer thermal propulsion. Fantastic. We're going to turn this over to questions from our audience in just a little bit, but uh, since we've got such a great panel here, I just uh, wanted to give an opportunity if anybody has a burning question that you want somebody else on the panel to answer, uh, I want to give you that opportunity. Any takers? Well, uh, I think we can turn to the questions from the audience. Uh, one that I, uh, I liked, uh, and I think Ben is gonna help me out with these questions, uh, but one that I particularly liked is, how does the public support for nuclear energy in space differ from the support for nuclear energy in Earth? Is there a way to use 
the excitement surrounding nuclear energy in space to bolster nuclear energy support in the United States? And is that even a goal? Anyone want to take that one? Well, the advanced reactors, the advanced modular reactors are certainly uh, adaptable to be used uh, in uh, uh, earthbound applications too. We're, we're, uh, that's where a lot of the work is being done right now. The military, for instance, is uh, interested in using them for distributed power uh, to bases, uh, including uh, forward bases. And there's work going on in the Department of Army. There's work going on uh, in you know, a variety of sectors uh, in DOD uh, that would be um, uh, earthbound. Uh, and um, there are programs uh, being pursued by a number of the, uh, the companies that are involved in advanced reactors uh, for um, uh, various power applications uh, throughout the world. Okay. Thanks, Colin. I'll, I'll jump in on that too. Um, that, you know, if you look at uh, public acceptance of nuclear, um, everybody has an opinion on nuclear. Uh, it stems from their own experience and, and background. Uh, and there's always a, a tracking, kind of a wax, waxing and waning of, of public support for nuclear um, in the way that we power our grid today. Uh, a lot of the advanced reactor community has uh, developed support in uh, areas where folks have traditionally not been as supportive of nuclear. And um, space, though, is a, is a subset of, of people who, who spend a lot of time thinking about and paying attention to uh, space. And um, I, I'd say while it's very exciting for uh, many people in, in the United States and around the world to think about space, it's when something new and novel happens where the average person pays attention to, you know, a big moment in history. Um, I think that the SpaceX launch earlier this year, putting U.S. astronauts uh, into space from U.S. soil was one of those moments where a lot of people uh, paid attention. Uh, some of the Mars rover launches have been that as well. Uh, so I think that there's an opportunity here that, you know, if, if we're able to demonstrate nuclear power in space, an opportunity for uh, people to, to maybe reassess their, their perspective on, on the benefits of nuclear power and to, to take a look at, at this as a uh, technology that's not just useful in the harsh environment of space, but that is useful in the uh, common environments here on Earth. And I, I think it may be a great opportunity to, to change and reframe uh, the perspective folks have. So I appreciate the question. Here's another one. I'm going to Does the Department of Energy envision its space mission is solely focused on meeting NASA's needs, or might there be independent space pursuits that serve other terrestrial interests of the department? Uh, kind of getting into the commercial uh, sphere and SpaceX's city on Mars a little bit. Alan, I'll, I'll jump in on that one. And, and I noticed that this question is similar to uh, several others about the commercial use of space. And I think we've got several uh, experts here that might be able to address, you know, how the commercial sector is viewing the opportunity of space. I think broadly there has been a, um, a pretty good amount of documentation built recently on the, the commercial opportunity of space, you know, what the space economy is going to look like in 10 or 15 years. And we're talking about a huge economic growth number. Um, that only happens if we can figure out how to safely operate in space uh, in a commercial environment that um, is fair and equitable. And, uh, and I think that, um, you know, DOE is looking at technologies. Traditionally, we've looked at technologies that are applicable for a specific problem we're trying to solve. Uh, we focus here on innovation and trying to de-risk some of these technologies and then figure out how to transfer them to market and uh, allow those to go make an impact uh, all around the world. You've seen evidence of, of uh, success here from the very you know, origins of, of solar power being developed here at the department to uh, the all the technologies that go into hydraulic fracturing to the very first uh, nuclear reactors ever being developed uh, by the Atomic Energy Commission, DOE's predecessor organization. So this is very much top of mind for us, thinking about how we move technology to the market. This question is really fascinating, though, because it's it's about what's the the sort of extreme environment where you can go build something and test it that's uh, novel for a space application, and how would you then backtrack and, and, and bring that into the more uh, common application? That's not DOE's traditional um, wheelhouse. You know, that's what people typically talk about for DOD or for NASA, uh, taking something to the field for a specific application 
and then figuring out how to uh, make it much more broadly applicable. I think DOE is going to be excited about the opportunity to try to uh, test things out in the, the exotic and sort of uh, aggressive environments in space, and then hopefully work with our, our partners and NASA and DOD who have good experience in transferring those types of technologies to market to think about how they could be more broadly applicable. That's true for, for any of the technologies we're trying to develop. So that said, is there anybody uh, on that, you know, would like to talk about the, the commercial sector's perspective and how you would like to work with DOE, uh, what, what those next steps will look like uh, in, in the ideal world? Eric had his hand raised. Uh, and and uh, respect with the, the, the kids uh, using all the broadband that we're providing. Um, so, yeah, one thing I'd like to, you know, touch base on a little bit is the role, you know, as we talk about how is DOE going to do this? How is NASA going to do this? It, it's, again, I, I, I need to put some that this is it's going to happen. The success is going to happen through these public-private partnerships. NASA has seen this in space, you know, where they... Uh, just the development of uh, resupplying um, crew and the cargo and crew to the ISS, uh, the government estimated they saved between 20 and $30 billion compared to the traditional methods they do this. So I, I think as we look forward and, and as you look at how we're going to commercialize, you know, the space and how, what role the private sector is going to play, it's going to do it, you know, hand in hand with the government, you know, the government helping out in ways and partnering with commercial and using best practices. We saw that on the International Space Station in areas, um, you know, new technologies that we're talking about, you know, through, you know, um, fusion and, and propulsion, um, but areas, you know, like 3D printing, you know, that, that didn't exist, you know, 10, 15 years ago on the International Space Station. Now they have advanced, you know, additive manufacturing capabilities on the International Space Station. And, and examples like that and, and the work that's, doing in, that's going on in microgravity is because of these public-private partnerships. So I think that's really, as SpaceX and Blue Origin, you're not, all these companies are gonna be doing more and more um, in space. I think, um, don't think that commercial is just gonna go off, you know, go rogue and, you know, go to Mars and uh, the moon and, and beyond all on their own. They're gonna be working with NASA and energy and DOD um, because I think that's, that's our, our, our system at its best. That's uh, the, the American economy at its best. Partnerships. Here's another question that's interesting because it kind of is two issues at once. What is the Department of Energy doing to stay competitive with China's developed space-based solar power program? Uh, and, and so I guess that addresses uh, not only this idea of space-based solar power, which has been in the works for God knows how many years I've written about it since uh, probably 15 years ago, but also uh, the issue of international com competitiveness and cooperation in space and in the energy sector, which, which is probably a pretty interesting play for the Department of Energy. Alan, I'll, I'll try to take a stab at that. I, I, we unfortunately don't have probably the right uh, people to answer the specific uh, tailored question on, on space-based solar power, uh, and, and I'm not as familiar with it. But, uh, you know, broadly, the question that you just identified, cooperation versus competition in space, I think is uh, something that the government grapples with every day. Um, we are, are particularly interested in, in finding ways to cooperate, especially with uh, like-minded countries that are, are willing to respect, you know, IP rule of law um, and and uh, maintaining a safe uh, and, and fair uh, opportunity for for commercial development in space. And this really goes to to Eric's point in, in a way. Um, the 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 fact that that industry is ready to step up and take on many of the responsibilities for space and develop the space economy is is hugely impactful. Um, I think this administration has taken the approach that. Uh, if there's something that the industry can do in space, we should uh, open up the opportunity for industry to excel there and to get out of the way and focus on those areas where yet, there's not yet a commercial uh, impetus to, to go into that, that realm. So 
you know, the, the uh, work that NASA has done, not just to develop uh, space capabilities on the industrial side, but to be able to, to offload some of the business, the day-to-day -day work that they normally would have, have spent a lot of time and effort managing at, at NASA uh, to private industry to focus on the next uh, technologies that they need to develop. I think that's very impactful. Hopefully that's uh, setting a course for how we can, we can um, work in space uh, in, in partnership with industry. Um, and, you know, let the government focus on those things where uh, really we, we need to spend our time and effort uh, without getting distracted on, on things that, that industry can absolutely handle. And in fact, they can do better than us. Um, so I, there is a, a certain partnership there that matters. Um, but to be able to ensure that uh, companies moving into that space have uh, their intellectual property protected um, and, uh, and, and their commercial rights respected, um, it is a challenge, and it's something that we, we grapple with on how we're going to work with all of the different spacefaring nations, especially as many of those spacefaring nations accelerate their programs as well. And, um, and I think that there's a, uh, another question I saw in the queue that, that gets at uh, an important point here. Um, you know, one, one of the important qu questions out there is, is space domain awareness with as much, uh, not just sort of space debris, but active missions that are floating around the Earth. Um, it's complicated. And, uh, you know, I, I, I know that we want to be able to, to make sure that uh, the commercial sector is able to, to work successfully in, in uh, various spheres, but also it's important that we know how to, to protect uh, U.S. assets in space and, and uh, to do so from, from other debris in space and even from an incoming, let's say, an asteroid. So there are some questions about uh, protection in space and, and uh, domain awareness. And I was wondering maybe if uh, Kevin would be able to speak to some of the great work that uh, NNSA has done to support NASA and, and DOD uh, broadly in that area. Uh, I was sidetracked on something. Um, I apologize. Ben, can you repeat the question? Sure thing. Kevin, could you just talk a little bit about uh, the good work that NNSA has been doing on uh, space protection and domain awareness is sort of the the challenge of so much stuff going on in space. If the you know we're going to have a growing space economy, whether it be protecting uh, the Earth from an in inbound asteroid or uh, just kind of how we we help uh, d develop technologies to um, support uh, defense of U.S. assets. Yes. Um... That subject is a little tricky because space protection is a highly uh, controlled subject as far as uh, the intelligence aspect of it. And so, but we recognize that there are a lot of satellites that are sitting in space and there's debris that is there also. And so we're looking at the natural types of things that put our satellites at risk, as well as the man-made types of things that might put our satellites at risk. And once again, we have the tools and capabilities that we're developing at our national laboratories to be able to address that, looking at the velocities, looking at the, the, the developing the codes to be able to simulate that. And, and we've done that in the past and we can, we'll be doing that in the future. And so there's a lot of tools and capabilities relative to space protection in that regard. It, regarding the, planetary defense, once again, we have our tools and capabilities where we're looking at mitigating if an asteroid comes to towards Earth. And it depends on if it's an early warning or it's a late warning. But if it's a late warning, then maybe a nuclear device is the only way that you can actually use. And then once again, we look at what does that nuclear device has, have to entail? And then also, uh, we use our modeling and simulation to be able to analyze it and project what impact that would have or, or what kind of mitigation that would have. And then we also model if the if we're not able to mitigate the, the satellite and it actually hits work and we look at Earth and we look at the impact and we model the impact and the tsunami models that might have tsunamis that might occur and things of that nature. So as Ben stated, we have again the tools and capabilities within the Department of Energy to analyze these problems, help to to solve these problems if we're faced with them in the future. Wow, uh, we could have a whole nother presentation on uh, the topics that were just raised uh, from space domain awareness 
to the asteroid threat. Uh, I, I would love to be in on that conversation, uh, but uh, we're running out of time. I did want to give Ben an opportunity to make some closing remarks. Thanks, Alan. Th thanks so much, Alan, for, for uh, moderating this discussion today and being here. Uh, you know, we appreciate your leadership and thought leadership in space over, over your uh, decades of career. And I, I think it's an exciting time for space broadly, right? The, the economic opportunity is, is massive. The challenges are huge. Uh, the vision that's been laid out is aggressive. And I think the department is ready to step up to do our role in meeting the, those challenges. Uh, we can't do it alone. Uh, I think that the discussion today on, on industry has, is really important. Um, this is going to take a, a public par private partnership or, or many really to, to get to where we want to go. And we at DOE see ourselves as, again, an enabler. Um, we want to help where we can and uh, bring together the, the technological capabilities we have, the expertise we have, and work within our networks. You know, again, a lot of the great work that's happened at DOE over the years has been peer to peer researcher to research. People go to conferences, they meet, they talk, they come up with great research ideas, and they develop those into programs. And I think that's a, a way of, of doing business that is tried and true, and it will continue to be an important part of DOE's portfolio. We'll keep working within our silos uh, of, of expertise to be able to support where necessary. But we also are really hoping that we can take a, a little bit longer term vision um, and approach to developing some of the big programs and meeting some of the big challenges that NASA will have. Just like uh, NASA and DOD and others are, are uh, counting on industry to be able to take some of their questions off their plate so that they can focus on the next big challenges, we're hoping that we can also take some of those challenges or parts of those challenges off their plate and provide the, the technical capacity to get there. Um, I think the, the discussion today has been robust. I appreciate everyone who jumped on this discussion uh, as, as participants. Um, thank you to each of our panelists. <laughs> And uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in today. I hope you learned something new about what DOE is doing in space. And if you're interested in partnering with us in the future, we want to be more accessible than we are today. And we want uh, industry to, to be able to reach out and touch base with us to, to find the right smart person at the right national laboratory or make the connection with a program. Um, and, and, and that network spans you know, many research institutes at universities as well. So as we look across our enterprise, we're trying to figure out a way to be more accessible and more uh, stronger participants. And uh, with that, would like to just, again, say thank you to everyone for participating today. Um, we hope that uh, you'll be partners with us in space as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the, uh, the only regrets I have from this uh, event today is that we're not able to be together in person uh, this is great to be able to network from different places, but uh, I wish we were all together, and I wish we were together with the people who have been uh, uh, tuning in this event, uh, that uh, we're, there are so many great questions we weren't able to get to, and, and so many people with interesting perspectives that I, I wish we were able to exchange, but I think you all did your best. I, I really love uh, how you participated in this, and it's been an honor to be your moderator today. And, and so with that, I want to thank the panelists again and, and, and thank uh, the people who have tuned us in and look forward to more from the Department of Exploration. Uh, for uh, this panel and for myself, this is Alan Boyle uh, telling you to watch the skies. <laughs>